Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. My name is Rebecca Lemoyne, and I'm the Director of Public Engagement and Learning here. Now, uh, a lot of you are students of all different kinds of arts disciplines. Some of you are QPAC members, some of you are donors and supporters. But I'm assuming what brings you all here tonight is a sense of uh, curiosity and interest. So you're going to have a wonderful time. Can I introduce you please firstly to Mr. Leo Schofield, AM, essentially an arts legend in Australia. Um, Leo has been connected to either run or on the board of or given an award by most of the major companies in Australia and some from overseas. Um, in addition to being an incredibly experienced arts manager, he is also a journalist, uh, a writer and a restaurant critic. But what you're going to hear more about tonight is he's a lover of beautiful things. And he'll be in discussion with my esteemed colleague, Professor Judith McLean. Uh, Professor McLean is a chair in arts education, which is a joint appointment between uh, QPAC and QUT. In addition to that, she's um, a very awarded uh, teaching artist, writer and scholar, and luckily for us tonight, also a lover of beautiful things. So please welcome Leo and Judith. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and uh, just for interest, that was Rebecca Lemoyne, who heads up the public uh, engagement and learning here at QPAC and is responsible for anything that's happening around tonight and responsible for this incredible program or the program that you're going to get. And uh, can I say right from the outset, just take time. It's a treasure house. Um, we've already had a, a, a good look at it, and there's so much to learn from it. So, it is indeed an honour to uh, be here and um, talking with Leo tonight. So, we're going to really um, look in at three aspects. We're going to first of all look at a little bit around Leo's life, because the, I think it's interesting, particularly for the young members in the audience, about why is it that we're all sitting in this theatre tonight? Why do we love the arts and dance in particular so much and why they're important? Um, and Leo's uh, really exemplifies that story. He's worked in the arts um, all his, well, been interested in the arts from a very early age. Then we'll talk a bit about the ballet and we'll finish off with um, getting Leo to read a bit from the big novel, which is uh, Don Quixote. So, hello, Leo, and um, it's great to be here and uh, with you. When we were talking uh, yesterday, preparing, uh, one of the things I asked you, and I thought we might replay this for the sake of the audience, was when did you have a first memory of being involved and loving the arts? Well, I wouldn't actually call it the arts so much as a performance. And I guess I was about six or seven. And I, went, I was born in a little place called Brewarana, uh, which is pretty dire, really. Uh, had my mother not gone to Burke to give uh, birth, she could have gone 100 kilometres to the north and I'd have been a Queenslander. It's right up there near the border. If you get a, go across the border, you'll be in a place called Diran Bandy. But uh, I'm, I wasn't and I'm a Brewarana lad. I was educated there, if you can call it that, till I was the age of eight. And at seven, I witnessed probably the first live performance I ever saw in my life. It was my cousin Shirley, and she had very nice long black hair, and they were worn in two plaits with very big bows on them. And Shirley was quite a skillful little tap dancer. And in a school concert, she tapped, but she did it while skipping. She had a rope covered with paper roses, and she used to skip and, and tap dance. It was quite skillful. And I probably thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. It, it, colour and movement for the first time, because of the drab old town, Brewarada. And she was gorgeous. At the age of eight, I was... I was an impossible child, I have to tell you, and I, I didn't get on very well with my father, and there was a decision taken to send me to school in Sydney, which was 700 kilometres away, and it was a 22-hour trip in the train. Can you imagine that, at eight, <laughs> being put on a train for 22 hours on your own? I didn't miss my dad, but I miss my mum a lot, and uh, it was a school run by nuns, and they were pretty... They, they, they were tough in Brewarana, but they were almost as tough in Sydney. Um, and at the age of eight, my grandfather, sorry, my mother's brother, who was very musical, played the piano, he, he had had a very strange 
and lonely childhood in that his father died before he was born and he immersed himself. He had a very, very good education and he immersed himself in music and became a very good pianist and eventually became a doctor. And he uh, looked after me a bit. He was considerably, uh, well, some years older than me. And he took me to the Theatre Royal in Sydney to see a performance. And it is as clear in my memory now, uh, sort of many decades later, uh, that particular performance. And it was of a very, very rare Gilbert and Sullivan opera called Princess Ida. But it was the first time that I'd sat in a theatre and I was on red velvet seats with boxes and gilt and little Wedgwood medallions all around it and red velvet curtains. It was a traditional Edwardian theatre, the old Theatre Royal in Sydney. And it was such a treat. I was in short pants and it induced in me a lifelong love of the, the operators. They're a bit out of fashion now of Gilbert and Sullivan, but some of you may have seen a movie by Mike Lee called Topsy Turvy, which gives a very good background to this. They were, they were phenomenally successful from the middle of the 19th century, really, till the middle of the 20th century. They were still going strong then. So who's, uh, to, who is it tonight who's going into the theatre for the first time to see a major production like this? Just let us see. OK, just a few. Most of you are old-timers. Well, you're in for a treat, those people who, who's, uh, who are going for the first time. So you were dazzled by um, Shirley and you were dazzled by her beauty, and you were dazzled by, I think you said to me yesterday, that she could keep a room of 100 people entertained. Yeah, so she was pretty so, so this, this was the beginning of your interest in the arts. Well, in, in performance, yes, in, in the idea of, of performing arts. I, yes. I have interest in, in the visual arts as well, but the, the idea of performance is that the idea that somebody can stand on a stage and create a mood that will keep thousands, 2,000, 500, any number of people entranced by skills that they don't have. I don't have them. I just love watching other people have these wonderful talents and the talents to move you, to make you laugh, to, to create memories that will live with you forever. And it's a rare talent. You think of a singer. They're on stage there and they, they've got a bit of gristle in their throat and they can make a noise that can entrance two and three thousand people and move them to tears at times. It's a, it's a remarkable thing that artists have and I think we should be very grateful that they enhance our lives. So we're going to move on. Just um, uh, You went to university, you went to Sydney University um, and got involved in the Drama Society, I think, and that was an important part in your Absolutely. development. Absolutely. I'd, I'd always been interested in the theatre and seen photographs. You never, there was no television, of course, but one was able to use one's imagination to see what particular plays were on in London. There was a lot of emphasis on what was going on in the London stage in my late teens. And we were influenced by that. And there was, wasn't very much in the way of, of serious uh, theatre. Uh, there was amateur theatre, very good amateur theatre, but the, the main companies were bringing in American musicals or plays from the West End. But there were other creative energies in smaller theatres with amateur actors. And it was all done on the smell of an oil rag, but it was building an audience. And mm. I became interested at university in, in both directing and designing. I, I used to like the sketch and do watercolours and things. It sounds awfully boring, doesn't it? Very poncy. But uh, honestly, I, I, I had the, fear, the urge for some form of artistic expression. And I knew I couldn't act. And I knew I couldn't put on a pair of pink shoes and spin for 32 for eight days. But I did know that I had this need for an engagement. And I began directing and designing some plays at Sydney University. And w with a, it was a very interesting thing in that there was an existing rather posh uh, and very uh, heretical lot called the Sydney University Dramatic Society, SUDS. And they were very snobby and they, uh, it was a closed shop for anyone who wanted to work with them. But uh, a group of people, in, including John Bell and a whole lot of other people that were at university at the same time, never got a break with them. So instead, we uh, formed a separate rival company. And we really wanted to shove it to this snobby lot. And so we, so we created the Sydney University Players. And if you want a, an example of demented ambition, <laughs> instead of doing just one play, we did a season of three plays. I directed and designed Brecht's uh, Good Woman of Sichuan. Ken Haller, who recently died, who founded the Nimrod Theatre. Ken directed... Um, a performance of Twelfth Night, 
which had John Bell as making his debut as Malvolio, and then there was a third play we did called Lysistrata, which is a Greek, Greek comedy about women who refuse favours to men until they stop warring. It's an interesting prospect, that. And uh, so we had an enormous success with these three plays, and we went on to do a lot of stuff. So when I went to London, which everybody that one knew who had any kind of interest in the theatre or the arts or architecture or whatever went on, in between times we did university reviews, and I had a great time because it was a golden period at Sydney University because there was not only John Bell, uh, Germaine Greer was doing Mother Courage, uh, Robert Hughes, the art critic, was studying architecture and he painted sets. Clive James wrote review sketches for it. Bill, uh, Bruce Beresford, who's just filmed Ladies in Black, began his career on stage playing in Lysistrat. It was the first time he'd stepped on a stage. And they were really a remarkable slew of people and a, a ferment, if you like, of people wanting to do things. So over to London, and I thought I might actually do a little bit of designing and directing until I went to see plays there, and I thought, I'm not this good. I'll just earn some money in advertising and uh, pay for tickets and go and see things and soak it up. So I was going out five times a week to, to plays, and it was, a, again, a glorious time for watching the classic English actors. And one saw them all, you know. Uh, Laurence Olivier, Michael Redgrave, John Gielgud, all of that. It was just quite routine that they'd be doing something either at Stratford Avon or in London. And I guess it's something that's stuck with me all my life. But I've never actively pursued any form of performance myself. I'd much rather be a voyeur or, or uh, somebody who makes it happen for other people. Yeah. And I think it's worth just saying for the young <coughs> members of, of the audience, it's uh, interesting that when uh, Leo speaks that he talks about these people who've become really the great uh, uh, pioneers of the arts in this country who all went overseas because 50 years ago, 50? 50 years ago? 40 years ago? Oh, it could be. I'm, I'm, I'm 83 for anybody's yeah, so, information. So in it's six readily available on Wikipedia, kids. <laughs> Yeah. In six generations, there was no Australian voice. There were no Australian uh, plays, there were no Australian, or very few Australian films. So in six, it's not a long time really, um, and that you're able now to, to really hear the Australian voice because of people um, like Leo. So, um, tonight we're going to be seeing a dress rehearsal. Your your, uh, you've seen ballet all over the world. What can we expect and what is special about a, a dress rehearsal? Well, a dress rehearsal is always the cranking up. You, you, in, in the theatre, I think you just hate the idea of a really good dress rehearsal because it doesn't leave you for any, any extra effort on the opening night. So you, you may see, as, as Rebecca has said, the odd halting thing. Sometimes, if there's a particularly difficult part uh, the, the performer will just sketch it rather than actually perform it. In a ballet, there's a famous bit in ballet, and you'll see it uh, in tonight, where, which is known as the 32 fouettes, where a dancer stands on one foot, gets up on that toe, and spins 32 times on the one spot. And it was introduced by Petipper as a showpiece in the Russian ballet, and it's now kind of expected in all the great classics. And, and people almost count down, you know, you know, 28, 29, 30, 30, oh yeah, she did them all, she nailed it. That sort of feeling, it's a spectacular piece. But they may not do that, right? just as a singer in an opera may not take a high note at a rehearsal, but you, it's just, there, there remains a bit of the picture that is to be sketched in. And that bit is the engagement with an orchestra and the excitement and the adrenaline that packs into an opening night. But a good red dress rehearsal is always wonderful to see because you, you, it displays something that I think is a truth in the arts, and that is vulnerability. I mean, perfection eventually is a little boring if someone's always perfect and never puts a foot wrong or a note wrong. It's it, the, the engagement that you can feel with somebody is when they are uh, a little vulnerable. You know, they, they may not have the greatest voice, but they have dramatic powers, and they may not be the greatest dancer, but they can move you to tears by the expression that they're able to pump into their performance. So that little is a, like a chink in armour. They are ar almost solid armour-plated, brilliant artists. But occasionally, there's a moment when you see they're human, and that often happens during a rehearsal, and you can move in and, and, and say, well, I love them, but I, 
it was just, I guess, a minute flawed. You can become engaged because of that slight vulnerability. That sounds fantasticated, but I think it's, the, it's a truism of the performing arts. Uh, you know, there are, and the greatest opera singer I ever heard was a woman called Maria Callas. And she had a voice that had a gear shift in it. It was in three sections. The middle was totally comfortable. The top could be like curdled milk, and the bottom sounded like a growl when you're changing gears. But I've never seen anybody who was so electrifying on a stage. So that's my point. But, and sometimes you see people who are extremely uh, heavy or whatever. You're not going to see too many of them on stage tonight. I'm here to tell you they've all got the killer bodies. But uh, the, the, you, you will occasionally see somebody, but just they've, they've got an oomph and an extra quality that just comes across as a personality and rather than a cookie-cutter performer. Uh, so talking about personalities, um, the history of this ballet, um, Rudolf Nureyev has a, a, a big part to play, but when we were talking, you said, of course, you know he wasn't the original choreographer. Chore choreographer of no, no. this ballet. Do you no, want to no. talk about that? Yeah, so most of these great three-act classic ballets uh, emanated from Russia. And it's very important to understand the, the uh, kind of nationality thing here. The, when the, the Russian czars were in power in, in, in the great imperial Romanov era of Ru Russia, they had money to burn, mountains of diamonds, mountains of emeralds, enormously rich state and, and an extremely divided society. But the upper end of society spent fortunes on their entertainment. And ballet companies and opera companies were very, very lavishly funded under the czars in Russia. And that was al allowed a lot of creative expression among composers, choreographers, painters. It was a, a ferment of excitement. And the, the, they wanted the world's best. So in opera, they, they flew in, or bought by train, I think, in those days, uh, some of the great singers from Italy, you know, Battistini from La Scala, great, great singers with enormous reputations in the latter part of the 19th century. They brought them in to perform in mainly in St. Petersburg, and the ballet uh, that they started or kicked up there was uh, essentially triggered by a bloke called Marius Petipa, and he created great spectacles and wonderful ballets, and such as the three actors that you, the three act ones that you see tonight. And, but that choreography over the years has become modified. You know, sometimes the shows would have lasted four hours, but nobody's up for that unless there's a bit of snow outside and you've fueled with vodka. The, 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 the whole th point was that they were court entertainments and very luxurious and, and indulgent. But over the years, there have been different approaches to the work. Just as you could take a, a work like Hamlet, which would have been done in daytime and, and the feeling would have been played by a boy. But modifications happen over the years and new ways of dealing with Shakespeare. A, a sort of unreverential at times approach to you can tr trim a play and cut out characters. With ballet, the same thing happened. Lots of bits that were a bit on the dull side were dropped and sometimes new choreography and new music was inserted. And what happened is that many people have had a shot at these classics, many choreographers, and Nureyev was one of them. He, when he went to Paris, uh, when he escaped from, from Russia and defected from the Soviet Union, he had a great season at the Palais, uh, not only as a dancer, but subsequently as a choreographer in Paris. And he, he created new editions, if you like, of the great classical ballet, particularly for the Paris Opera Ballet. And subsequently, other people have, have taken the classics, the Swan Lakes and Sleeping Beauties, the great cornerstones of the ballet repertoire, and just shuffled them around a little bit without losing the thrust and modifying the music a little. But it, it's possible that uh, Nureyev, having danced in all those works, knew which were the duller bits, so when he restaged them and, uh, or recreated them, he was able to do it uh, with a, a, a contemporary audience in mind. And, and he's left his mark on all of, these, the, all of these great classics, which were originally made by Peter Bar, but they've been in editions by him, and new choreography added or, or subtracted. Yes. Um, and in the program, there's a, a comment that uh, a great company can be known by the care and attention it devotes to its young talents, so young people in the audience listen to this, and by its abilities to project the ballet uh, to reflect our times. Does La Scala do that? It certainly does. I think we, uh, 
in a sense, the interesting thing to me about ballet is that with television and all the cinemascopic effects and, and effects on, that you can get on television, nothing ever matches what you get in a live performance. It's a different, it's a different thing altogether. It's another beast. You can see clips on YouTube and say, isn't that terrific? When you see it on the real thing, you say, wow, it's got a different impact always on you. Right? I, can I, can I you talk about what that is for you? What, what, what is the difference? What does the live do f for you? I guess it's the humanity of it. I mean, you know, it, it's real. Uh, there is something about a real sound from an orchestra as, which is more exciting in many, many, many ways than hearing it on the radio or on a CD. And ditto with, with, the visu with film visual. There have been many wonderful films made of ballet, uh, and particularly of, of Don Quixote, which they shot it in a... They shot a version with the Australian ballet down in an aircraft hangar with Nure of dancing in it in an aircraft hangar at Essendon Airport uh, and becomes one of the best shot and filmed ballets. But again, it's not, it, it's got a different dimension. If you, the cameras be able to be, be in different points of view from, uh, from and, and it gives it a greater liveliness in many ways, but it's still, for me at least, nothing, 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 nothing beats a live performance, a yes. live performance. It's, it's something about one human being contacting a group of people through their artistry. And that sounds a bit wanky, but honestly it's true. These people give up their lives, their bodies, to make us feel, feel better about everything. Happy, sad, to tap into our emotions. It, it, it's incredible. Some of these dancers will have been training as Nureyev did, from age eight. And they have a very short period at the top, if you like, but for all of them it's worth it because that's their method of expressing inner urges to be creative. And Nureyev was an interesting figure. Uh, possibly, possibly had he not had all the celebrity of, of defecting from the Soviet Union, from communism, and, and moving to the West at a time when there was a the Cold War was on, and uh, at the same time striking an incredible bit of luck uh, with Margot Fontaine, whose career was just ebbing, would be a nice gentlemanly way to put it, and his was soaring, and he partnered her and the two of them. She had another eight years of celebrity as a basis of Nureyev's charisma. And there are a lot of people who can do things technically, but I think what the real brilliance of, of in performing arts is when artists can engage with audiences and, and move you more than others. And you'll rank them in your own experience. You'll say, I love that thing, but I like this one better, you know. And your reasons will be always personal because it's a human need for, for entertainment. And particularly with ballet, I think, for beauty, it's very difficult. I mean, ah, from a tiny little town in Mumfuck, New South Wales, I emerged as somebody who could, was moved by beauty and really gorgeous be physical beauty. And, and we, we neglect that a lot now. We, the sheer verve and beauty is, is something that... In art now, I think there's a lot of rubbish being passed off as exciting art. I think there's nothing beats the reality of somebody who is creating something beautiful or moving, and I don't mean necessarily beauty in a chocolate box sense, but beauty in terms of touching uh, something in your soul, your heart, your, in your memory, really. Mm. Yes, we talked about this yesterday, this notion of art and that aesthetic experience, and for those who don't know that term, the aesthetic meaning truth and beauty and connection, that it's able to do that, um, whereas going and buying a new dress might feel good for a while, but it's a different kind of uh, experience. And it's this, this alignment of beauty and truth and touching you that I think characterises the arts. Um, yep. In real life, too, it's something in nature. You can move and see something that is beautiful and it just stop you, it halts you and that you have a little brain snap while remembering that image. It's, mm. it's true with a painting. You can stand in front of it and... It can do something for you that may not do for everybody, but it just mm. moves you in a special mm. way and has, has a meaning beyond just a piece of pigment on a canvas. Yes. Um, and we don't talk about the transcendental or the spiritual very much. They're kind of 
dirty words today, aren't they? Or neglected words rather than dirty words. Let's get on to um, the uh, piece. Uh, what's your understanding of the term quixotic? Can you explain it to people and where the word came from and how it relates to this piece? Yes, there are many phrases from Don Quixote that have come into our lives. Quixotic is one of them. Tilting at windmills is another, and there, of course there was an episode in this book where, where the knight of the soulful countenance actually sees a windmill and he mistakes it for some giants that he has to go forward and slay. Uh, a bit dopey, poor old Don Quixote, but he has all these crazy adventures in pursuit of a great beauty. But um, it seems like a quixotic means something that's got very little chance of success. In other mm -hmm. words, you know. You, you're just t taking on something that you can't possibly ever achieve. And so it's very quixotic of people to do. I think we were quixotic in a way, putting on three plays when we were 21 you yes. know, and had no money. And you can do things that just may not come off, but they have a different kind of success, which may be personal. So it might be a perfect time for you to read oh. just a little about the windmill incident because we'll be... And, of course, um, Don Quixote is often being called... Uh, a sane madman, hasn't he? Um, tilting at windmills is a fairly odd thing to do. Yes, it's taking on the impossible, in fact, or being deluded into uh, deluded into imagining that you can create a great deed when you're. It's just a bit quixotic, so to speak. But uh. let's read from Cervantes, uh, written in the 15th century. And if you ha if you haven't read it, can I recommend it to you? It's hilariously funny, um, and as Leo just said, many of the proverbs that we know today, like the proof is in the pudding, um, they come out of this book. Very, very funny. So, And it'll be very good as a doorstop afterwards because <laughs> it's a big bloody book, let me tell you. This is the war and peace for Spain. This is mm. Spain's version of war and peace. Yes. But it's also been one of those remarkable pieces of literature that have, uh, have sparked creativity in other people not just in ballet, but there have been other stories, operas written about, in, in French there's uh, Don Quixote. Uh, there have been all manners of takes, if you like, on this, on this tale of this particular knight, uh, an old guy, setting out to do great deeds with a broken down horse and a spear and a, she a little shield and a tin helmet like a chamber pot on his head and his little sidekick who's riding a mule, a little fat guy called Sancho Panza and, and they, as an esquire to him, and they go around Spain doing what they think are great deeds. But in this, this is uh, from chapter 13, there are probably about 90 chapters on it, I haven't checked, but this is about the, dra the brave Don Quixote's success in the dreadful and unimaginable adventures of the windmills together with other events worthy of happy memory. As he was saying this, they caught sight of 30 or 40 windmills standing on the plain, and as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, fortune is directing our affairs even better than we could have wished. For you can see over there, good friend Sancho Panza, a place where stand 30 or more monstrous giants with whom I intend to fight fight a battle and whose lives I intend to take, and with the booty we shall begin to prosper. For this is a just war, and is a great service to God to wipe such a wicked breed from the face of the earth. What giants, said Sancho Panza. Those giants that you can see over there, replied his master, with long arms. They're giants with arms almost six miles long. And so he gets on his trusty steed, and charges at the windmills, and both the horse and the rider are swept up by the, the sweeps of the mills. And you'll see it, they actually reproduce it rather nicely in, in the ballet, which is a reduction. I mean, you're not, you're not up for, you know, 24 hours of, of seeing. They, they, these are selected scenes from Don Quixote that make a, a gentle narrative, and they do int introduce, as, uh, as most people need to do in entertainment today, a little bit of romantic comedy in the, in the wooing of... Uh, of the very, very pretty and sparkish little uh, ballerina or dancer called uh, Kitri and her lover, the barber. His name is uh, Basilio. Basilio. Yeah. Basilio. As in the barber of Seville. Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, um, in my research, what it, Cervantes wrote this book really when he was just out of jail. He was jailed for being a failed tax collector. Um, 
And uh, he wrote this book, and it was enormously popular. And of course, he had to keep writing. Um, and out of this book, uh, it's, it's hailed as really the growth of the modern novel because the characters actually learnt something as they went along, and it wasn't just the... Oh, exactly, and, and, and that quote about war, well, it, it's terribly opposite today, isn't it, when you think about it, you know? Uh, it's a negative view of war and what war can achieve. Yeah, that's absolutely mm. right. So many of the characters in uh, the ballet actually are comedic com uh, Commedia dell'arte yeah. Yes, characters. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the Commedia dell'arte was an Italian form of travelling art. I mean, they travelled with a little, with props and costumes and set up in town squares all over Italy. And there were certain definable characters within the Commedia dell'arte. There were, there was always the pretty Columbine, and there was Harlequino, who was Harlequin, and there was the Doctor and Pantalone, and some of their stuff was quite crazy slapstick and other was romantic situation comedy. And these travelling troops from these characters grew a, a different kind of, of theatre. It was a more secular theatre, uh, not exactly like the religious theatre of the morality plays that dominated stages in Europe uh, through the 13th and 14th, through the Middle Ages, really. But uh, it, it was a different popular form of, th of simple theatre, boldly expressed, the characters are drawn very broadly rather than with lo a lot of subtlety. Um, ballet's an interesting form for telling a story, if you think about it. I mean, we're so used to stories being told in words that we, we are expected in a ballet to have the artists express themselves in a wordless fashion. So their bodies are at the service of telling you what the character is about, the walk, the jumps, the sprightliness, Whatever, the stately moment. There's a scene in this where there's some bullfighters all come on and they're very flashy and flashing their capes and doing a little bit of a divertissement. Uh, with that. And, and they're sort of stock characters, if you like, of, of drama in the, in the uh, early centuries, not, not really in the last. Well, mm. maybe some have gone over. But Commedia dell'arte is, is a combination, too, of, of mime. And that's the other distinguishing mark of it. There was some singing and music, but often the characters were working entirely mm. in mime. Mm. And mime is a big part of ballet. People have to say, there are certain things, this means you've got a beautiful face, and this means no, and that means uh, oh, every, every gesture has some sort of movement to it, or mm. cursing, whatever. You'll see tonight. And, and you would say that Kitra is really the sort of Columbine, the young sure, lover. Sure, she is, yes. The, the, yeah. And so it works in archetypes. So if you think about um, uh, Kim Kardashian, for those younger ones in the audience, you know, she's, <laughs> ki she's kind of an archetype of supposedly the it girl, but is she really? She's just really a fabrication. You know, is she, who is she really? We don't know. These are kind of archetypes in, in a similar way. Uh, the lover, the lover's suitor, the father. You'll see the characters yeah. there. Yeah. Um, OK. And so the aristocrat who is mocked quite a bit, the toff with the big feathers in his hat, you'll see it as well. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, the music for this work uh, is the original music, is that right? It is. It's by a, a very popular composer called Minkus. Uh, composing for ballet is, uh, is in itself something apart and a good deal of ballet music was created to just be tuneful and it wasn't until you had the, the great Tchaikovsky creating the three great ballets in Swan Lake Nutcracker and Sleeping Beauty where the music is so brilliant that it can stand alone on a concert platform rather than just be an accompaniment for dance. And that Russianness uh, blew over into the 20th century with Igor Stravinsky, who again created three great scores, uh, in, well, smaller ones in Pulcinella, but the great ones were The Rite of Spring and um, The Rite of Spring and, uh, I think I'd want to say, you know, Petrushka, Petrushka, and those, and, those, and Firebird. And, and The those, Soldier's Tale. What? The Soldier's Tale as yeah. well. That was, and those great. will stand aside on a concert from that great music, even though they are also wonderful music to be danced to. But a lot of music is, I would never say second rate, but it's gentler. It's, it's more easily approached and not quite so spiky, if you like. But, but the good composers that were able to compose for ballet make beautiful music 
to dance to. Um, just recently, um, I read that the French government is giving every student uh, 500 francs to be able to decide uh, what cultural events they would like to go to. Um, and I know when we talked before, you gave me a wonderful quote about letting your imaginings, your imaginary oh, yes, forces that's right, work. Yeah. Yes, and I just wondered if you could talk about the importance for young people in developing the imaginary muscle and how it's not something that just happens. If it's, if it's neglected, it doesn't occur, and why that's important. Well, the French have always been very enlightened about their culture, which is a very particular and, and wonderful and varied culture. And the deal was slightly better than that, Judith. He gave them 500 euros, oh, not euros. just five, oh. So every, every young person of 18 in France has been given a voucher. Can't, you can't spend it at McDonald's, but you can spend it on a book or going to a film or going to theatre or to an approved cultural activity which is a great idea because it actually is good for people who are absorbing culture and, and, can, and maybe can't afford it or just need to kind of in a very unembarrassed way go and experience it. But um, I think developing culture in the way, I don't think you can engineer it, but you can certainly coax and attract audiences in a very uh, seductive way. And I think it would be a great thing for, for enlightened governments to follow suit there. I'm delighted to hear that the Queensland Government has pursued this international series because I think it's had a genuine impact not only on, on the reputation of Queensland but also on the, the opportunities that it presented both in tourism and locally as an extraordinary building block which has built into the Queensland Ballet. Who'd have thought that 10 years ago that was going to happen and who'd have thought that 10 years ago that we might be sitting here uh, seeing the, the great ballet companies of the world and, some, and in terms of the Hamburg visit in, on this very stage, seeing John Neumeyer's great company from Hamburg and next door hearing the Hamburg uh, Opera and the Hamburg Orchestra. I mean, these opportunities are, are of those of an enlightened government and in Australia we too easily succumb to uh, the view that people are dealing with a bunch of bogans. They're not. They're, uh, honestly, governments treat us often like idiots. Uh, I remember Patrick White had a particularly, a particularly apt phrase at a rally in Sydney at the Opera House. And he said, talking about Gough Whitlam, he said, for many years we've had politicians trolling around the halls in Washington and London and generally behaving as though they represented a group of rustic clowns. And we aren't a group of us. We're good thinking, sensible, practical people who are open to ideas and open to experience. And I think that's the great joy of watching this development. It's certainly over my lifetime. It's been a real thrill to see Australians celebrating the arts and celebrating our own culture and developing our own culture, which is terrific. But um, we do it with influence from other people who have done it. And we can learn from everything. And that's why I raised the issue of the 500 euros, because this is a student movement, and I just want to plant a seed in you students here, that you have a right to culture, and you have a right to have the very best, uh, because you are all going, you are people of Australia. I'm going to finish by um, just one last question. Is there a particular La Scala style? You've, you've brought us all of these wonderful ballets over the years, and we've been able to see uh, Bolshoi, Hamburg, New York Ballet, Paris Opera Ballet. Is there something particular that we'll, that, that we'll see with La Scala? Well, there is, and I'll tell you, it's very like the Italian temperament. Uh, if I compare it with two other companies that have been here before, uh, the Bolshoi is very muscular, the jumps are big and it's very Russian and outgoing. The French are models of elegance, the shoulders, the neck, everything is absolutely perfect. Italy has elements of both of those and it's a very Italian thing. And I think we have a particular affinity with the Italian culture here in Australia. For years I uh, reviewed restaurants and I watched the transition from disgusting English cuisine through to pretty good Apologies provincial to French and eventually to all of us being kind of crypto-Italians. And I mean, we love Italian food. It suits our temperament. And, and it, it's, it's this temperament sometimes of a little bit of 
risk and devil may care and outgoing quality. I think uh, rather than that hyper control of the French, which is very, very beautiful, or the brutishness, if you like, of the Russians. I mean, it's, a, it's a difference between, I guess, uh, beef and uh, fish and uh, a terrific pasta dish. Really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which is what you're going to see. That's a wonderful metaphor to finish on. Would you please thank Leo Scofield? Thank you.